Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Grade Up. I hope you all are doing really well. Through the course of today's lecture, we'd be looking at a Russian masterpiece of the 20th century called Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Uh, this particular work, because of the fact that it was a political satire of 1930s, was actually an extremely important work to tell us about the Stalin government of the 1930s. Also remember that this is a highly subversive text, despite the fact that the creator Bulgakov was a favorite of Stalin. So how essentially could the favorite of Stalin write such a subversive book? He did not publish this book while he was alive. This book was published years later. The final edition of the book was published in 1973. So this is an extremely interesting read to come to know about the Russia of the time. So do remember that this entire political satire is telling us about the 1930s of Russia, Stalin government, USSR, how you are able to see that there is a top down government. There is a top-down government that we are able to see in this particular novel. By top-down government, that means the people in power, they make rules and that needs to be followed by everyone. Others have to abide by those rules. Everyone else needs to follow those rules which have been created by people in power. And especially when we are talking about the USSR period under Stalin in the 1930s, you must be aware about, you know, you should keep this in mind that the writers were actually writing under a lot of censorship. So uh, they were subjected to either exile. So a lot of people migrated to France uh, because of the fact that, you know, they weren't really able to survive in this particular climate in Russia. Climate, that means the political climate where you didn't really have a voice of your own. Uh, writers were exiled. They were persecuted. They were even executed. They had a terrible uh, time during this particular period. So do remember that Master and Margarita, which was eventually published, published almost, uh, you know, more than 30 to 40 years after the death of Mikhail Bulgakov, like I said, 1973, a proper publication date is one of the most important works which tells us about the uh, the Stalin period. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Do remember that and we will be discussing certain aspects related to this in today's session. Uh, please feel free to connect on the Telegram channel that is Nirja UGC Net English for all your PDFs and other uh, important sessions. There are certain sessions which have been lined up. Also, classroom students, I hope you're aware that tomorrow at 9 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock you have an extra class and day after tomorrow at 9 o'clock you have an extra class so I've already told you that uh, at 3 o'clock and uh, besides that if there would be any other sessions lined up I will of course keep you guys posted over the telegram channel so whenever we are talking about Master and Margarita this work actually started this work actually started in 1928 and it took Bulgakov uh, uh, approximately more than 10 years to script it there's a very important line in this work that manuscripts don't get burnt and that is the reality you know there is this story is having two parallel narratives one is the 1930s Moscow and the second narrative is the first century Jerusalem and the narrative is actually shifting between the two time zones so the first point that all of you should remember is that there are two shifting narratives in the work there are two shifting narratives that we are able to see in this particular work one is the the present day Moscow, the 1930s Moscow, and the second one is first century Jerusalem. First century Jerusalem is the second period that we are able to see. Okay, so this particular work that we are talking about, Master and Margarita, was considered to be a counter-cultural text. Please remember that it was a counter-cultural text. Why was it counter-cultural? Because it was satirizing the politics of the time. It was against the Stalin government indirectly. It was a piece that was trying to highlight. It's a kind of political satire. It is a political satire that is criticizing the top-down government. The top-down government is not giving any voice to anyone. No one is getting the voice. No one's getting heard. No one is actually having any voice uh, to, to just make sure that they are venting out their opinions. So that way, it is a counter-cultural text. You know, if you visit Russia, there is actually a museum of M M Michel ba uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, where Bulgakov had lived. And if you visit that particular museum, you will be able to see that there are characters from Master and Master 
margarita so this is an old apartment where bulgakov used to write and you know just like anton chekhov bulgakov was also a trained doctor bulgakov just like another important russian writer anton chekhov anton chekhov was using medicine right that was his actual profession bulgakov was also uh, a person who was a trained doctor so that is what we are able to see and then finally he of course starts writing for newspapers and of course then he's writing you know what is very interesting is that stalin used to uh, protect bulgakov stalin was a person who had uh, who was known to have visited many bulgakov's plays um he was uh, like you know trying to protect bulgakov and it's very ironical that bulgakov had also written against stalin and his government which was published years later so it's a subversive text it's a counter cultural text it is a text that is attacking the political uh, consciousness of stalin's government or it's a political satire on the 1930s stalin government okay so please keep that in mind that when we are talking about the historical backdrop 1930s soviet ussr was actually something that was being ruled by stalin and this particular dictatorship of stalin is being criticized in the master and margarita okay now when you're talking about this a very very popular line in the novel which says manuscripts can't be burned uh, now what happens is that the second part there was a question that had come the second part of the novel is actually semi autobiographical the second part of this particular novel is considered to be semi autobiographical why because this character master because this character master who is there right this character master actually burns his manuscript after it is rejected after it is rejected by publishers and this is exactly what had happened with bulgakov bulgakov did not produce master and margarita in his lifetime because he knew that that wouldn't really lead to any positive consequences he was sure about the government of the time he was sure about the fate that this particular work would meet uh, so he was pretty sure about it so we are able to see that the character of master the character of master over here in this novel the second part of the novel we are technically able to see that you know he is also burning the mac manuscript okay so please keep that in mind all right and like i said the stalin government period was a highly censored period writers were not given any permission to write uh, they couldn't really produce their works this is a question that has been asked so you can keep that in mind that it was published first in a serialized manner in moscow moscow was the name of the magazine and then later on as a complete edition it was published in 1973 okay so do remember that that in this particular subversive text was not published during the stalin government had it been published then then obviously bulgakov would have had to face the consequences okay now when we are talking about bulgakov bulgakov was actually taking approximately over 10 years to write over 10 years to write this novel and this of course was published in a censored form later in a complete form in 1973 so this work actually you know th this is a very very interesting topic 20th century and banned books books have been banned for multiple reasons in the 20th century for instance some books like lolita lady chatley's lovers they were considered to be or even remember i had given this uh, video on the telegram platform about tropic of cancer uh, by miller so tropic of cancer was also one of the banned books So 20th century is a very important period because for multiple reasons we are able to see that books are getting banned a lot of time the content is not considered to be appropriate a lot of times the books are banned because they are anti party they are anti politics they are commenting about the times and therefore they are banned so what we are able to see over here is that there is censorship being operational in the 20th century governments want to control uh, whatever is written government want governments want to control memory they want to control memory of the people they want to control uh, everything like you know even we see a lot lot of times um, the important issues are not getting highlighted because of the fact that you know um, we are able to see that people in authority actually control the spread of information all right now this is very important that you know the complete version the unexpurgated that means the non sanitized original version was published in 1973 as we are talking about and this particular work is actually considered to be a 20th century masterpiece why because not only is it a political satire 
also because of the fact that this particular work this particular work is using magical realism okay there is a use of magical realism money starts following from up uh, there is so you know even when you visit the museum in russia where balgakov uh, uh, balgakov's museum in russia there is like this head there's this head that is lying down because you know the heads are uprooted from the body in the novel the heads get uprooted from the body in the novel there are magical realistic elements that are taking place in the strange world in the strange world so you know it's trying to tell you that the times were crazy and also remember here you can just write down a point you can just put a star and just write down a background to the novel the 1917 russian revolution where the whites and the reds were fighting together the whites were symbolic of the old order and the reds were symbolic of the new order and bulgakov was on the side of the whites so he was on the side of the old order okay but still what you are able to see is that people who were siding old order doesn't mean that they were against a uh, democratic um, so called you know democratic way of looking at things they were in favor of democracy also so that is something that you can keep in mind now this is important there are two parallel narratives there are two parallel narratives in this work that we are able to see the novel is juxtaposing two parallel narrative one is the moscow of 1930s the other is jerusalem in the first century So the novel is shifting from these two times. The novel is shifting from these two times. Remember when we are talking about writers, the Australian writers like David Malouf and Imaginary Life, uh, or whenever we are looking at multiple texts. So, for example, uh, one hundred or uh, the one uh, hundred years of solitude by Gabriela Garcia Marquez. You are able to see shifting narratives. So shifting narratives is a very important feature of twentieth century literature. The literature is not static at one particular place; it's moving from one place to another. There are shifting narratives that we are able to observe. So, what is an important point that you have to keep in mind is that we are able to see that the novel oscillates between two perspectives. There are two shifts that are taking place. Okay, there are three very important characters. Okay, there is the master. the writer the margarita the muse of the writer and then there is a devil there is a devil there are three most important characters that we are having over here okay and what are we able to see especially the three characters in the 1930s plot these are three characters in the 1930s plot in moscow also remember this work criticizes this work is actually critiquing it critiques the selfless uh, the selfishness okay the selfishness of people of moscow that they were not questioning because they were getting economic growth and prosperity they were not questioning the government apparatus they were not at all questioning the government apparatus they were happy with the government apparatus they had no questions no concerns at all with the government apparatuses at all so sorry okay so please keep that in mind that this particular book is also critiquing you know people because they do not criticize the governments is a major reason why we are able to see governments and dictatorial governments actually flourish that is a commentary that bulgakov is trying to make that people are equally responsible for bearing with the government apparatus so there is the devil and this devil is disguised as professor wooland this devil devil is like you know devil has come to the town to stage a magic show there was a question that had come in one of your entrances how is the opening of the novel the opening of the novel shows the devil having come to the town to stage a magic show to stage a magic show okay and the master is another character so the first is uh, you know the devil professor wooland disguised as professor wooland second is master who is a novelist this is the autobiographical part even bulgakov was trying to talk about how in these tyrannical regimes writers are at the receiving end writers are unfortunately not free to voice their opinions writers are unfortunately for, are not free to talk about the concerns that they have okay and margarita margarita is there margarita is of course the muse of the master the inspiration of the master she has married a bureaucrat but she loves the master So there are three important characters in the contemporary plot of 1930s. We are having the devil in the form of Professor Wooland. We've got Master and we've got Margarita. 
okay the master is actually burning his manuscript okay he is burning his manuscript and this was an autobiographical part this was a semi autobiographical part and margarita what she is doing is she sells her soul to the devil okay why is she selling her soul to the devil because she wants the release of the master to take place all right so please keep that in mind that you know you are able to see that this particular work is combining magical realistic aspects but at the same time it's actually trying to talk about the times it's trying to talk about the totalitarian regime of stalin's government in 1930s okay the parallel plot plot is presenting the action okay the action of masters destroyed novel this is very very important he bulgakov was very conscious about the restrictions on the writers the restrictions on the writers during during stalin's government so that is something that he is of course talking about okay and of course the condemnation of jesua in jerusalem that's a parallel narrative so there is the first century jerusalem and 1930s moscow okay so please keep that in mind let me just ask you two quick questions okay the first question that i have for all of you which are the two important narrative settings which are the two important narrative settings in the novel you have to tell me this and the second is you have to tell me three important characters in the 1930s setting three important characters in the 1930s settings very quickly please tell me What is the right answer very quickly please tell me what is the right answer here Yes everyone please very very quickly two narrative settings and three important characters we've just discussed that Excellent excellent Saima Bhatt has answered it Pooja Maurya has answered it Santosh has answered it Garima Sharma has answered it brilliant okay so i hope it is absolutely clear the first century Jerusalem and 1930s Moscow these are the two important settings and we are able to see that there is shift taking place but these are two parallel settings and three important characters in the 1930s excellent Garima Sharma Kartika everyone's answered it correctly Pratibha Ritu Lidji everyone's answered it correctly right okay the three important characters are the devil who's disguised as professor wooland we are having the master who's a writer who's who's burnt his manuscript who's burnt his manuscript and then we are having margarita who's married to a bureaucrat but she is in love with the master and she sells her soul to the devil to ensure that master is getting released to ensure that the master is getting released okay i hope it is absolutely clear so far so good okay now when we are talking about this entire work there are two very famous lines that come as it is manuscripts don't burn manuscripts don't burn you can never repress the voices of people somewhere down the line you would be able to see that people come back their manuscripts come back their writings come back you would be able to see that they are coming back okay and cowardice or cowardice is the most terrible of vices if you're not seeing anything that is also you know it's not just if you are a perpetuator it's not just that you are a criminal or it's not that you are actually being dictatorial but if i am also someone who is trying to like you know deal with it i'm not raising my voice then i am also actually a coward and that is also a vice that is not a virtue it is a vice cowardice is actually a terrible vice that we are having okay so please remember these are very important lines which actually come in your exams also so basically what is being attacked over here in the novel the soviet's totalitarian regime the stalin's government of 1930s the totalitarian regime of 1930s is actually attacked in master and margarita please keep that in mind all right this is being attacked and therefore this work is an example of political satire this work therefore is an example of political satire please remember that okay this writing uh, has actually influenced people like salman rushdi rolling stones okay you are able to see that this work has influenced a generation of writers who have actually spoken so even when you talk about salman rushdi when you're looking at of course like you know a lot of his works which are dealing with magical realism including midnight's children what you are able to see is that there is a parallel narrative there is a parallel narrative which is running which is critiquing the times which is a, a, a political satire of sorts it's a political satire of sorts that is what you are able to see 
okay also please keep this in mind that whenever we are looking at the satire of the soviet life satire of the soviet life you are also able to see a faustian element you are also able to see goethe's faust why why are we able to see goethe's faust why why are we able to see i just shared this with you let's see how many of you are able to answer why is it compared to goethe's faust why what is the right answer why why do you think why do you think you know there is a parallel or there is this this uh this so called resonance between goethe's faust why anyone very very quickly please excellent payal datta has answered it correctly payal datta has answered it correctly for the first time okay and and the first time because remember margarita is selling her soul to the devil she is selling her soul to the devil because she wants the release of the master so selling of soul you are trying to bargain your soul so that is a faustian imagery that is coming in that is the faustian you know the selling of the soul is actually something which is faustian but look at here the selling of the soul is not for yourself The selling of the soul is actually for the release of another fellow person. So that is actually a comparison that you can make that it's actually something for good. That 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 is being done over here in case of Margarita. Okay, so please keep that in mind. And what you're able to see is that you know this entire work is trying to just politically uh, look at the times and trying to tell us that you know how people were repressed completely during the Stalin government and was really difficult for them. Compare it with 1984. Compare it with Handmaid's Tale. Compare it with uh, like you know the Yellow Wallpaper also, which was a kind of a dystopia that we had spoken about. So just to capture every. thing that we have looked at so far it is one of the greatest russian novels of the 20th century why because it is a counter cultural text it is a subversive text it is a text that is going against the repression of the writers okay and like we said the setting is the 1930s stalin government stalin government you know stalin government was actually infamous for erasing historical records they were erasing historical records they were trying to wipe the memory away of people all right and bulgakov like i told you just like anton chekhov was actually a doctor who was born and he later started writing and he was a favorite of stalin imagine like you know now from the graves when stalin would probably look at the works of bulgakov he'll get a heart attack that you know this is the man that i trusted uh, but he was true to his profession he was true to his profession that is what you are able to see there are surreal elements like i told you money falls uh, you know there is money that falls from the sky so do remember that there are certain magical realistic elements in the novel there is money falling from the sky that you are able to see uh, there are heads of the people that get away from the bodies so for example if this is me suddenly my head would come up and you know you go to a different direction altogether uh, that is what you are able to see so it's very very violent also at times there are violent episodes that are seen but ultimately it is a pointed satire of the system it is trying to criticize the system in which it was being produced All right. Now the novel, of course, has got a cult following. People really look up to Bulgakov. We are able to see that this is a majestic book. But do remember, it is countercultural. It is countercultural. It is a work that is actually telling us that how the top-down governance, top-down governance. What I say, you need to follow. What the government says, I need to follow, is never a good way of governance. Is actually never a good way to govern people. So you are able to see that the Stalinist mo. Moscow is actually getting criticized. What we are able to see is that the book is criticizing the 1930s Stalinist Moscow. The book is trying to tell you, uh, you know. So there was this question that had come. Uh, the book is showing you the devil and his retinue, and his retinue. Retinue is that you know his his so-called accomplices. All right, and who are a part? This is very important. Please write this down. Who all are a part of his revenue? There is a talking cat. There is a talking. 
paying cat which is a part of his revenue retinue retinue that means people who are accompanying him and a wall eyed loon okay a wall eyed a wall eyed loon who is there so these are creatures the animal creatures and how the devil is manipulating master how we are able to see that you know the master the writer the novelist is getting manipulated over here that is something which is shown okay so these are all pointers that you have to remember master and margarita a brilliant criticism of the times in which it was written now this picture i want you to keep in mind i i don't really know whether other restrictions would come anyway this is actually stalin okay this is actually stalin that we are talking about and you know people had actually seen for example if this was a man if this was a man and this is a very famous picture this man was actually missing in the other picture can you see that this is exactly how the totalitarian regime was erasing the memory of people they were erasing the memory of people uh, there is a very fascinating account of this also you are able to see that on history.com or even national geographic actually conducted a documentary on this that how stalin's government was actually slowly and steadily erasing all historical records so someone who was going against stalin they were actually removed from the memory of the people they were removed from the memory of people that is what you are able to see in historical records so that is the power that this kind of a top down government was holding they were not allowing any trace to actually live forward that is what you are able to see so this picture is in some way symbolic of that and like i said manuscripts do not burn this is a very very popular line from here and you are able to see therefore it is a political satire it is a historical fiction because it's taking you to the moscow of 1930s imagine if you were not aware about russia if you were not aware about russian history but after today's session you would know or after reading master and margarita you would know that 1930s russia was a stalin government russia 1930s russia was a government of totalitarian regime of stalin the stalinist regime was following a top down approach all right so please keep that in mind that this particular work is actually a historical fiction a kind of a political satire and it is of course telling you the plight of the writers what the writers had to undergo what the writers had to deal with how the writers were subjected to exile censorship execution they were having really stifling environments they couldn't really project themselves at all right and unfortunately what is really sad is the fact that people were also not voicing remember cowardice is a is a vice as well a very popular line from the work cowardice is a vice as well if you are actually silent against any sort of injustice you are also a part of the crime okay so that is what and these are of course a few examples of the surreal magical realistic elements that you you are able to see so this work which was actually started writing in uh, in 1928 and he wrote it up till his death in 1940 was finally published in 1973 and this is attacking the stalin government of 1930s the three important characters master margarita and the devil and the devil is having his retinue as well the talking cat who is there and the loon the wall eyed loon these are the two members of his retinue okay let's very quickly come on to the quiz for today there are a few questions let's very quickly try and answer them and see how many of you are able to get it this is a hybrid quiz multiple questions have been taken from uh, like you know various places let's see how many of you get it right the first question is there please answer it Mamita Kanra please join on time we've already discussed this for all, over half an hour okay excellent everyone's answered it correctly everyone's got this answer right this is the right answer joseph addison is the writer who is a famous writer of cato cato was actually trying to preserve um the democratic framework is a beautiful work written by joseph addison that you are able to see so please keep that in mind that cato is a tragedy cato is a tragedy written by joseph addison who is one of your most important writers of the augustan prose uh, era remember addison and steele they are pioneers of cato spectator the journals that are being written over here so cato is a tragedy by joseph addison the second question uh, which writer among the following had written an ode on the birth of christ own ode on the birth of christ who's writing ode on the birth of christ 
which writer was writing ode on the birth of christ i'll give you a hint this is a writer who's considered to be a christian writer okay the hint is this is a writer who's considered to be a christian writer okay what are we considering him to be we're considering him to be a christian writer he always had religious themes in his mind he always had religious themes in his mind so what is the right answer excellent some of you have answered it correctly right milton is the correct answer milton is the correct answer he's writing the nativity ode so nativity ode basically means the ode which is telling us about the birth of jesus christ and here what we are able to see in the nativity ode and on turning 23 where he says that i've wasted 23 years of my life in both these odes he's actually trying to talk about his vision his vision of writing the epic and that is where we are able to see that in 1666 uh, 1667 religious allegory paradise lost a religious masterpiece a religious epic paradise lost is getting published and that is of course you know the big magnum opus because of which we know milton also okay so that is the right answer let's look at question number three the comic character of tony lumpkin appears in the comic character the comical character of tony lumpkin is appearing in which work Yes, Surbhi and Lakshmi, that is right. He's called the Lady of Christ because of his looks, his color of the skin that we had. Absolutely correct. What is the right answer here, everyone? Very, very quickly, what becomes the right answer? Great. I can see some of you have answered it. She stoops to conquer is the correct answer. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So most of you have actually answered it correctly. Right. Most of, it, uh, most of you have answered it correctly. All the plays are actually very, very important that you're able to see over here. But of course, she stoops to conquer is a work which is important of Oliver Goldsmith. Oliver Goldsmith is just not writing The Deserted Village, which is an important transitional work. Right. Uh, the Deserted Village based on the Enclosures Act. But what you have to remember is that she stoops to conquer is also an important play written by oliver goldsmith and you know many people have actually considered it to be a, a path-breaking work especially when we are talking about the times uh, right um, and and please uh, please keep this in mind that this is of course an important character tony lumpkin tony lumpkin is an important character in she stoops to conquer by oliver goldsmith today itself if you get the opportunity do revise the works of oliver goldsmith put them in one uh, corner and just make sure that you've revised it the importance of being earnest is equally important arms and man is important juno and peacock by sino kc again very very important all these dramatic works are crucial from your examination perspective okay let's come on to the fourth question who said shakespeare is above all modern writers the poet of nature shakespeare is above all the modern writers the poet of nature who's talking about this fairly simple question let's see how many of you get the right answer Who said that Shakespeare is above all modern writers, the poet of nature? What is the right answer? Right, right. That is the correct answer. That is the correct answer. Absolutely right. Okay. Dr. Samuel Johnson is the person who is actually talking about this. Uh, he is calling him the poet of nature. This is, of course, his entire notion in the preface to Shakespeare, which ideally all of you should have read. All of you should actually read preface to Shakespeare. It is a path-breaking and important work, right? And it's very, very self-explanatory. Everything's are everything is neatly written, and you know there are lines that get picked up from the text and they are given to you in your exam. So it's always a good idea to actually read the original text versus reading the summaries because actually the summaries are a little more difficult and complicated and convoluted versus if you read the original text and you try to cull out the material from there okay so that is always good let's come out to the fifth question which writer right which of the following critics does uh, does sydney not draw upon in apology for poetry sydney does not draw upon in apology for poetry okay in apology for poetry sydney is not calling on these writers what is the right answer here very very quickly let's see how many of you get it right so sydney is actually not mentioning about mm -hmm. 
राइट राइट धेनु शर्मा हेज गिवन द राइट आंसर ऋतु डोगरा धेनु शर्मा कुहू पूजा माही एवरी वन गिवन द राइट आंसर प्लेटो इज मैंशन एरिस्टोटल इज मैंशन हॉरिस इज मैंशन लोंगाइनस इज नॉट मैंशन ओके लोंगाइनस इज द पर्सन हुज नॉट मैंशन इन अ पॉलिट्री फॉर पोइट्री अ पॉलिट्री फॉर पोइट्री और डिफेंस ऑफ पोइट्री विच इज अगेन री अडेप्टेड बाय पी वी शेली एज वेल वे ही टॉक्स अबाउट पोइट्स आर दी अन अक्नोलेज लेजिस्लेटर्स ऑफ मैन काइंड सो यूर एबल टू सी दैट हाउ अ पॉलिट्री फॉर पोइट्री इज ट्राइंग टू रेस्क्यू पोइट्री इज ट्राइंग टू रेस्क्यू लिटरेचर फ्रॉम द प्यूरिटन अटैक्स लाइक द अटैक्स मेड बाई स्टीफन गॉस so please be mindful about that that is also crucial uh, from the examination perspective so please do keep this aspect properly in mind okay chalo let's very quickly come on to the next question question number 6 gb shows apple cart exposes the unrealities of it is uh, exposing the unrealities of what is it telling you about gb shows apple cart is telling you about the unrealities of what yes kuhu absolutely what becomes the right answer very very quickly what is the right answer uh gb shows the apple cart exposes the unrealities of it is exposing the unrealities of what right absolutely absolutely okay now please remember gb shaw was of the opinion gb shaw was of the opinion that of course democracy is very good uh, but democracy where a large chunk of people are not educated is not going to be a good decision people if they are not educated and if you're giving them voting rights they won't be able to make correct selections so apple cart is actually rather favoring monarchy is rather favoring king and you know is rather favoring that yes it's always a good idea that you have a monarch at the top and it is actually criticizing democracy it is actually trying to criticize democracy right that is what you are able to see it is telling you that democracy is a complete failure when a major chunk of people are actually not exposed to education they will never be able to take the right decisions for you or they will never be able to take the right decisions for the country so please remember this this particular work apple cart is actually a satire by showing you the character of king magnus it's trying to satirize democracy it is trying to tell you that democracy is a complete failure till the time we don't educate a lot of people so that was a common conception that a lot of people had okay question number 7 please quickly answer it written rock is an offer written by a very simple question and this catholic novelist has to be on your fingertips because you get questions year after year in your net exams very simplistic novels written and even if you are trying to solve his novels uh, a few times like you know you're just trying to go over it you will be able to get the right answers okay Absolutely, very good, Lakshmi Kumari. He was a Fabian Society member. Absolutely right, right. A majority of twentieth century people were actually trying to uh, follow socialism, and that is the reason you are able to see that he is a Fabian Society member. Very good, Lakshmi. Very good. Okay, that is a good, brilliant point that you have made. F- uh, fantastic. Great, great, great. This is the correct answer. This is the correct answer. Graham Greene is the right answer. Graham Greene is actually a Catholic novelist. Okay, and whenever we are talking about the works of Graham Greene, he has been a writer who's been constantly being asked because twentieth century Catholic tradition is being represented in his religious novels. And Britain Rock is one of his religious novels. Today, also, if you get the time, go back, take a look at Graham Greene. Try to populate your notes with the uh, with the various as. Aspects with the various works that Graham Greene has written. Uh, the other writers are equally important: Golding, Iris Murdoch, uh, Alex Huxley. All of them are very important postmodern writers. But Graham Greene, an exceptionally talented one. Okay, this is the eighth question that we have. In which tale of Canterbury Tales does Chaucer present the mob as stormy people? The mob is presented as stormy people. What is the right answer here? Very very quickly. In which work are we able to see that the mob is presented as stormy people? uh so so do remember you should at least have a web chart with all the stories written with all the major stories written and what are the major stories trying to say it is always a good idea to collect that in one place and have it for yourself yes yes aziz absolutely the idea of life force was also there included here Okay, let's see how many of you are able to answer this question correctly. Very good. Abhi Rami has answered it. Lichi Menon has answered it. Uh, who has answered C? Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. The clerk's tale is absolutely the right answer. The clerk's tale is actually presenting mob as stormy people. Okay, mob as stormy people. Mob as not having. You know the presentation of mob. For example, in Julius Caesar, uh, we are able to see that you know mob.
mob uh, mobs uh, they they not really having an individual identity so to say they just follow the herd mentality they are not really looking at reason and rationality but wherever people are going they will go in that particular direction so there is a herd mentality that is followed and uh, we are able to see that uh, you know chaucer is trying to give a little different perspective he says that they're stormy it's all chaotic it's all like a pandemonium they're all absolutely chaotic in the clerk's tale that is how the mob are presented wherever you have written your shakespearean notes uh, sorry your chaucerian notes just put it at, at the corner this particular uh, like you know this particular question that the mob is referred to as stormy people in the clerk's tale and you can just go back home and try to create a small little web chart or like you know a flow chart with all the tales which are important and a few lines uh, on the characters that are there or a few lines on like you know within one or two lines what is the story all about uh, if there is any important criticism on that particular story or what is the order in which it is coming uh, whether it is the first tale or the last tale that also so you can just make like you know on one page itself you can capture all these things for chaucer's canterbury tales so it will be very very helpful question number 9 which is shakespeare's shortest tragedy classroom students i hope you remember 2068 lines right that is of course not in Included over here in this option, but which other than two zero six eight lines is the shortest tragedy that is written? Okay, which is the shortest tragedy? This is question number nine. Which is the shortest tragedy that we are able to see very quickly? Okay, very very quickly, please. right that is the right answer nimar has also answered it correctly right uh, so which is the shortest tragedy the shortest a of course there is tragedy all right and tempest is not a tragedy that we are having macbeth is the shortest tragedies that we are having okay it is one of the shortest tragedies that's written and of course uh, remember in the afternoon also we were discussing about thomas de quincey's essay on knocking at um, uh, the, on knocking on the door of Ham macbeth so we are able to see how this entire story of ambition the witches which are represented is one of the shortest tragedies all the plays of shakespeare you can actually make a one page summary of all of those we will also be discussing some of the plays right uh, but do keep that in mind especially with the classroom students we will be having these sessions but uh, please keep that in mind that these plays you don't really have to go in detail of all the plays but especially some major tragedies some mature comedies the romances uh, the roman tragedies they are of course important and it's always a good idea if you know the important characters if you know the important scenes if you know the important speeches if you know the important lines which are coming in right so that is always a good idea for instance ripeness is all uh, is a very famous line from uh, king lear or you know there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow is coming from hamlet so all these kind of important things or like you know the other very very popular famous lines the families which are there for example they've asked you questions on the two families in romeo and juliet so all those kind of questions are always a good idea for you to like you know literally have it on your fingertips okay chalo let's come on to the next question question number 10 very simple question let's see how many of you get it right <clears throat> okay what is the right answer everyone Yes, sir. B. That's right. That's also a very, very popular line. Alexander's feast for the power of music is an ode written by Dryden to celebrate, right? And the celebration of most of you have got this right. Most of you have got this right. Saint Cecilia's Day is the right answer. So whenever we are talking about these, are actually called the musical odes that were written, right? Uh, so uh, Alexander's feast, right, and the song on Saint Cecilia's Day. So it is trying to celebrate Saint Cecilia's Day. It is trying to celebrate Saint Cecilia's Day. Again, it is always a good Good idea to maintain Dryden and his works on one page. Here. The three important satires of Dryden and the lines are very important. The middle that you are having, Macflecknow, Absalom, and Achitophel. The plays that he is writing, how he is writing these tragic plays uh, that were being performed. The names of all the tragic plays. Uh, the essay on dramatic poetry. How is it trying to be framed out? What are the four characters? What are the four characters representing? All those details are uh, like you know pretty important. And lastly, uh, when we are talking about Dryden, it's always a good. idea 
if you've actually got you know in hierarchical order for example uh, when is he becoming a royal historiographer when is he uh, becoming the first appointed officially appointed poet laureate when is dryden writing his magnum opus uh, right that you're able to see uh, so so everything becomes really important for example annus mirabilis is a magnum opus a political uh, political epic that he's writing because of which he's getting many favors and he was an opportunist because he's also converting his religion so all the works from the beginning that he's writing odes that he's writing on oliver cromwell then when you know charles ii is coming so basically it's always a good idea if you can capture dryden and his works on one page itself for your better understanding to get a better idea what are the various works that dryden has written okay so that is always a good idea so let's very quickly come on to the next question this is question number 11 let's see how many of you get the right answer which of the following poems by browning is on life of a musician which of the following works is actually based on life of a musician this is of course <coughs> a work remember that we said was actually taken from tempest okay which is actually a work which is based on the life of a musician what is the right answer very very quickly and this is a question that we've actually looked at previously also <coughs> sorry yes shrinivas absolutely Dhenu Sharma, P. Soumya, Satya Lakshmi. Everyone's got the right answer. Okay, Abbot Wagler is actually a work. Abbot Wagler is a work which is on a musician. Fra Lippo Lippi is not a musician. He is an artist that we are having. Okay, Rabi Ben Ezra is considered to be one of Browning's most optimistic works that we are having. So Abbot Wagler is the correct answer. Abbot Wagler becomes the right answer. So please keep that in mind that when we are talking about the work which is actually dealing with the life of a musician uh, of Robert Browning, it is Abbot. Walkler that we are having, okay. Robert Browning, his life, his um, affair, and the subsequent marriage with Elizabeth Barrett Browning is also important. And of course, the dramatic monologues that he is writing to shape Victorian literature, Victorian poetry in particular, that is also important. Okay. Let's come on to the twelfth question. This is the twelfth question. This is the twelfth question that you have. What is the right answer? The periodical all year round was founded by. The periodical all year round was founded by. Who was the founder of all year round? <coughs> sorry what is the right answer here very very quickly please and then also today at 10 pm uh, we are having a class on the grade up application yesterday's class which was not uh, which did not take place at 7 pm will take place today at 10 pm so anyone who wants to complete the mini modules on deconstruction is free to join this class at 10 pm on the grade up application uh, so it will be a very brief quick class to look at the philosophical principles behind deconstruction uh, so 10 pm is the class okay so if you have any concerns re regarding deconstruction also you can join Charles Dickens is the right answer the periodical all year round was founded by Charles Dickens so remember a lot of writings in the Victorian society were actually being published in serialized editions they were getting published in serialized editions that we had and all year round was one such important like you know periodical that you had in which works were getting published okay let's come on to the 13th question let's see how many of you get the right answer what has been defined as that which presents an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time in an instant of time what is the right answer very very quickly and be very careful while answering it and this is actually a quotation given by uh, an important writer so do look at the question first and then try to answer it <clears throat> Charmin, today there is no class at nine o'clock. Tomorrow there is a class for classroom students, uh, and by classroom students I mean the extra classes for the week. So at nine o'clock and ten o'clock we have a class tomorrow for the classroom students, and day after tomorrow again at nine o'clock or I think ten o'clock. One of these times there is another session scheduled for the classroom students. Okay. so uh that is there okay now most of you are writing epiphany which is not the right answer epiphany is not the right answer epiphany is a moment of sudden realization epiphany is a moment of sudden realization okay this is a quotation that is taken from ezra pound this is a quotation that is written by ezra pound okay uh, that define uh, right what has been defined as that which presents an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time look at the word instant of time so that is an image according 
to Ezra Pound, an image should actually capture everything, right? So, for instance, that is exactly what you are able to see. That is what imagism is all about. That is what imagism is all about. Brevity. Try to capture things in minimal words as possible, right? You need to be as brief as possible. Brevity is something which is important. You need to be as brief as possible, right? You need to capture that particular image. So, image is the right answer. Do be careful about this particular point. Let's look at fourteenth question. Two more questions. Let let's at least complete fifteen questions for today. D. H. Lawrence's Women in Love is the sequel of Women in Love is the sequel of which work? Very very quickly, please. Women in Love. D. H. Lawrence. All the works are very important. You should actually know the works of D. H. Lawrence. Uh, Amit Chaudhary is actually writing a work on the poetry of D. H. Lawrence. So Amit Chaudhary is actually talking about the poetry of D. H. Lawrence. D. H. Lawrence is rather writing on the poetry of Thomas Hardy. So he is writing on the poetry of Thomas Hardy. And Amit Chaudhary, the writer of Brave New World. Amit Chaudhary, the Indian writer, the writer of Brave New World, is actually writing on the Brave New World. Is a work written by. Amit Chaudhary and Amit Chaudhary is actually writing. Amit Chaudhary is actually writing on the poetry of D. H. Lawrence. What is the right answer? That is absolutely right. Rainbow is the correct answer. Shruti Bhatta Mishra has answered it correctly, uh, and so have the others. Rainbow. All the works of D. H. Lawrence should actually be imprinted in your mind in a chronological order. Remember, he is a novelist dealing with star equilibrium. Blood novels are associated with him. He is talking about the novels of blood. That means how our family relationships act. Actually, impact us psychologically. He is talking about the Collier community. He is also talking about the Oedipus complex and Sons and Lovers. So, a path-breaking writer in his own way of 20th century. All the works, like I told you, should actually be imprinted in your mind. And it's always a good idea. You can actually go back to your rotulage, look at what is written in your rotulage around D. H. Lawrence. Try to make notes out of that. Try to put all the works in a sequential order on a sheet of paper. That will always help. So, today the writers, out of the 15 questions that we've done, assemble. your notes please that will be very helpful let's come on to the last question for today there are more questions but we will continue in the 10 pm lecture okay uh, let's very quickly see the last question very simple question Okay, very very quickly, please. What is the right answer here? What is the right answer here? And please always remember, these writers were actually getting inspired by this one person who wanted to change the way an American scholar was formed. He wanted to change the very definition of an American scholar. He wanted an American scholar to be different from the other people. That is what this writer wanted. What is the right answer? Okay. Santosh, a new world, okay, a new world, not a brave new world, a new world, which is telling you about a retired family and how their son um, is coming back to them after he's got divorced. And you know, it's very similar to today's time because you know when during the lockdown, unfortunately, we were associating happiness with going for a movie, going outside, shopping, etc. But these, uh, like you know, lockdown has made us think that are we genuinely happy as a society or are we attributing our happiness to other things? Okay. Uh, fantastic! Most of you have got it right. Ralph Waldo Emerson is actually the inspiration of Walt Whitman's *Leaves of Grass*. *Leaves of Grass*, a path-breaking work, being published multiple times, but telling you about a shift that is taking place in American poetry. A shift to free verse is clearly visible in the form of *Leaves of Grass*. Today, go back home, look at all these 15 questions, try to compile your notes accordingly. Uh, right? It's always a good idea to do that, and uh, it'll always be very, very helpful. Okay? Thank you so much for joining in. I will see you. Uh, I'll see. some of you at least uh, in the 10 pm session and if you have any doubts any concerns please feel free to let me know about it all right take good care thank you so much god bless bye